Uh, everybody's familiar with TRL uh, basic principles at TRL 1 and flight proven at TRL 9. Uh, the fun part is uh, what's so special about TRL 6. That's the border between uh, developing a technology uh, up to six and then um, it can be incorporated into a flight mission at that point and it can be matured through seven, eight and, and nine. Next. So uh, here's how the thought process works in, in a flowchart form. Um, I'll give you some references and, and this is just a, uh, a figure out of uh, one of those references. Um, but basically, <laughs> it, it, if it's flown before and you're using it for the same purpose in the same environment, then it's a nine, you're done. But if uh, your environment has changed or um, the way it's being used has changed, then you sort of back up to five and uh, and then rebuild your yourself back up. Um, yeah, if you get to the end of that flow chart, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're you're below one, so uh, start over next. Um, this is the same way uh, TRL one through nine, but I like this much better because it explains why seven is different. All right, seven is not really in the path between six and eight. It's its own thing. It's a uh, a demonstration in space of TRL 6. So you don't go 6, 7, 8. If you're on the ground, you go from 6 to 8. And if you need to do a demo in space, you go from 6 to 7. Um, but that's a pro prototype. And then 8, eight is your, your flight unit. Um, so uh, seven's not a necessary step. Uh, it's only really done where um, a, a prototype has flown. Um, so a lot of things, uh, if, if you have uh, a breakdown of your system, and it includes things like structure or harnesses or radiators or simple things for which a prototype has flown many times, then uh, a seven is appropriate um, to, to call those things. Next. So this is the, the, the nugget of, of the talk. What's so special about six? The definition is a system or subsystem model or prototype demonstrated in an operational environment. Um, so uh, the, the three important parts of that definition is uh, system, prototype, and operational environment. So the uh, prototype is a high fidelity system or component prototype depending on whether you're talking about TRL6 of a whole system or or TRL6 of a prototype of a component in the system um, that prototype has to adequately address all the critical scaling issues it's built and operated in a relevant environment to demonstrate operations um, the exit criteria is that you've demonstrated you documented the test performance and uh, it matches your analytical predictions. So um, these terms uh, are, are where all the discussion ends up being. What does high fidelity mean? What does prototype mean? What is a scaling issue? And what does it mean to have a critical scaling issue? And have they all been um, uh, addressed? And what's a relevant environment? and what is operations under um, critical environmental conditions. So it, in general, <laughs> uh, this means you, you have the prototype, you operate it, it performs as, as you need it to perform in thermal vac after exposure to vibe and survival temperatures. Now, this doesn't mean a full qual program. Often I have um, proposals coming through Goddard where they say, oh, it's going to take us, uh, you know, six months and a million dollars to do uh, Vibe and and Thermovac, right? And we, we don't have that money. I said, well, do you have something in your lab right now that works? Yes. What if you put it in the Thermovac chamber this afternoon and see if it still worked? Oh, we could do that. 
was like, okay, that's TRL six. <laughs> it doesn't take six months and a million dollars. It it takes demonstration of it still working in the operational environment. Um, if you took the thing in your lab bench and you put it in the thermal vac chamber and it stopped working, well, then you would not be at TRL six. Um, so that that's kind of the fundamental question of if you're there or not. Um, you might not need to do thermal vac if that's not relevant. Maybe thermal is relevant, but vacuum isn't. Or maybe vibe is not relevant. If your technology, you know, consists of something that's a block of metal, uh, you don't need to vibe it to prove that it's not going to break. You can look at it and and know that it's not going to break. So um, that would vibe would not be a relevant environment to that uh, piece of hardware. Um, some weird environments that often get overlooked when you just say shake and bake, but could actually affect your technology is radiation, atomic oxygen, whether you're in zero G or not, which is very hard to simulate for more than a few seconds in the drop tower or more than 20 seconds in a zero G airplane flight. Um, noise and all the definitions of noise, stray light noise, EMI noise, vibrational noise uh, that may affect how your instrument works. Um, and the reason uh, TRL is sort of the standard by which you need to um, get to before PDR means that the scary stuff is behind you and you're going to start spending big money. PDR is the I'm still retiring scary risk, and after PDR is, the risk is mostly behind us. We're ready to spend the real money. So that is why the TRL-6 gate exists um, as part of uh, before PDR. Next. All right, so um, if put yourself in proposal land, um, there have been, you know, Weaknesses that I've seen in Goddard proposals, I've seen in other proposals, I've been in industry and seen these exact same proposals. The re reviewer um, may not agree with TRL that that what you've written there actually uh, demonstrates uh, that your TRL six. Um, so the sort of best practice in proposal land is you know to get an independent assessment of are you at TRL-6 or not? And if there's any fuzz on that, um, then uh, offer a technology plan. So you could say, you know, we consider ourselves at more than TRL-5, but to ensure, um, you know, <clears throat> no uh, gray area on TRL-6, we will do this test or, or whatever. Uh, tech development plans need to have uh, a strong introduction about what exactly you're going to do and why. A flow path that says how the components uh, for each thing that's less than six get done, and then they get put together into a system, and then that system gets tested in the environment uh, to six with a schedule and funding behind it and uh, off ramps or backup plans. If this test doesn't go as expected, we will back up and use this proven technology that happens to, you know, weigh more or use more power or not be quite as good in performance. But there is a backup plan for anything that is not clearly TRL6. Next. Um, so if you're proposing, your plan A should be everything at six or better at the proposal and get an independent assessment to, to validate that. Um, plan B is to have one or at most two things out of five with a good and good means with funding and with schedule plan to get to six well before the PDR with the off ramps I mentioned. And uh, if you can't do A or B, you should probably not propose and instead get funding for technology. And that's why you guys are here uh, at Hesto, which is 
technology development. Next. Uh, this is another flowchart um, that you can find uh, in the documentation for um, technology assessments. This is very useful for um, figuring out what is a technology or new technology and what's heritage and what's standard engineering. Um, and often this is very qualitative and people argue about it. Um, but this flowchart hel helps you. Um, you know, if you're doing something that's never done, been done before, that's the first uh, question box there, then it's obviously new technology. And um, if you follow the path all the way down to heritage, that means that uh, the function is not new or novel, the performance is not new or novel, the form and fit is not, has already been demonstrated in space in the same environment or, or less averse. Um, and that you haven't changed the heritage, therefore your heritage, right? And if you, and if you get some of those, but not others, then, then you're in that uh, engineering area. Next. Um, so this is how um, a, a TRL assessment works. Uh, some come called TRA, Technology Readiness Assessment. Um, anything that you think is six or above, put ample proof. Basically, the, what I like to advise is you put a picture of the thing um, that you're claiming is six in a test chamber. Um, and next to that, you put a plot of it meeting its whatever its performance is, noise or, or um, you know, detection capability or frequency or whatever you, you need that. Uh, particular item to do. And it, there's the proof in two pictures. Yes, we tested it. Yes, it works. Um, if anything that is borderline, uh, get an independent assessment. And um, uh, at Goddard, um, you can ask for an assessment from uh, me, the center chief engineer, uh, the engineering Director at Chief Engineer Tim Trinkle and the engineering chief technologist Mike Johnson. And if you get two out of the three of us um, for an hour, we can usually uh, do an independent assessment pretty quickly. Um, and anything that's less than TRL6, you make a technology development plan like we talked about before. OK, next. Uh, this is an example of how um, things uh, roll up. If you have, in this example of, of this uh, chart that's broken out into subsystems, assemblies, and elements, you know, this, this might be your system is a whole instrument, your subsystem is the electronics, your assembly is a circuit board, and your element is a... Um, you know, a DC to DC converter or or something that's on the power board, which is part of your electronics, which is part of your instrument. Um, if there's technology down at that lower level <coughs> um, that hasn't been brought to six, then that sort of lack of being at six uh, inherits its way uh, up. So, um, you you can, for example, if if you want subsystem A to be um, TRL six, and that consists of assembly A, B, and C, B and C are standard engineering that not people aren't going to question. It's really only the A that's technology. Then you would need to bring A to level six, and then subsystem A would be at level six. All right, next. Uh, this is a, a couple of uh, laboratory environment versus relevant environment. So TRL5 is a lab environment, TRL6 is relevant environment. Um, and the, the subtlety in those definitions are, um, you know, the, if the lab environment is without respect to the impact of the environment. So, uh, you know, you, you could, um, be 
in a lab, which is not necessarily going to have um, the temperature range or vacuum or other things that would affect you. But the relevant environment would be the operational environment um, that demonstrates anything that would be cause a risk to the product either breaking or not working the way you want. Next. Um, and then lifetime is something that comes up all the time. Um, some systems, you know, need to operate for a certain number of cycles or a certain number of years or a certain number of um, samples. And therefore, um, you would want to, in the case of TRL-8, like qualified is run a life test. Uh, the problem with, say, TRL-6 requires you to run a life test is that it might take two years and you, you don't have two years to complete your TRL-6. So uh, the sort of expectation for six is to verify by test or analysis that it's resilient to the effects of life limiting mechanisms. So, um, you know, whatever in your design is that's causing the life limit, you need to uh, analyze that and and show by test that your analysis is, is relevant and and therefore your life is not a technology risk. Next. Um, I mentioned TRAs. This is a formal way to, to evaluate your TRL. Um, you can um, um, use them either uh, on a whole mission or a subsystem or components. You might uh, confirm a TRL after you've done a test campaign um, or to project forward that your test campaign will give you the TRL 6 usually that, that you want uh, when it's done. And so getting somebody independent to sort of check that before you go spend the money to do it is worthwhile. Uh, projects may convene self-assessments um, and or an independent assessment or stakeholders, meaning people who are giving you money, may convene an independent assessment. Um, and uh, formal TRL-6 reviews often precede uh, mission or instrument PDRs for high profile items uh, as an independent way and a gate into the PDR. Okay, next. Uh, I mentioned this already, we can, we can go on. And uh, this is sort of the for more info. Uh, there's um, two documents there. Um, the Technology Readiness Assessment Best Practices Guide is an agency document. Um, and Goddard, all the centers have their own processes as appendices in that NASA document, Goddard's are in Appendix A1. And then uh, JPL has uh, guidelines uh, as well that are um, more in detail. And next, I think that is it. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hyde. So that concludes the first block of speakers. Um, now I'll open it up for question and answers. We have 20 minutes scheduled for that. So please stand by as I release everyone's um, microphone and cameras. And then um, if you could just use the raise hand function and we'll call on you at the order that you've raised your hand. So stand by. And uh, if you could, the first set of questions, if, if they could just be for um, uh, Dr. Hyde, please. Do we have a question for him? Um, the mics and the cameras have been released, so if anyone has a question, feel free to raise your hand. Uh, 
Uh, going once for Dr. Hyde. <laughs> what is? Okay, I, there I we go. Like one. <laughs> go ahead, Steve. Yeah. Uh, hey, Tepper. Um, yeah, I have, a, I have a question for you, and it's kind of for the group as well. But um, is there so? If let's say you you have a some chip or something, and you don't know what its TRL might be. Um, of course, you could be safe and go through the whole thing, but it may be that it's been used before, especially if it's some bit of electronics like an EDC or something. Is there a place to go that um, kind of documents that kind of stuff besides just searching in in like literature and such? Which you know, I, I feel like literature is kind of a poor place. People don't often publish on that kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, uh, you would expect um, an agency like NASA to to be uh, a little better at, um, you know, data basing things that have flown before. Um, there is for CubeSats, I think, an effort to uh, database all the sort of components that have flown and, and what happened to them. Uh, out of Ames uh, Small Satellite Virtual Institute, but there's there's nothing agency wide. To be honest, the best source is probably the vendor. Uh, if there's a component that you know can be used in space, uh, talk to the vendor and ask them where has it been used before, and you know don't just take their word for it. But that would that would give you uh, a, a start to uh, go talk to people that have used it before. Do you know, are there like commercial companies that sell that kind of information like a, that you could ask and they might no. know? No, no, okay. I don't think so. I mean, for for the Air Force and military and NRO, uh, aerospace has a good knowledge, uh, but even then I don't think they have like a database of parts. Uh, instead, it's more uh, in the heads of the various uh, discipline um, experts, and the same thing's true at Goddard, right? If um, if if you were looking for, you know, a DC to DC converter, you could talk to the power branch at Goddard, and and they would probably know uh, what its heritage was, or even you know provide a recommendation um, for something that would work just as well that is heritage. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess I would I would extend that to the. RPIs that if you do have questions, you know, come to us and then we can try to find out the answer through asking Tupper and some others as well. Yeah. All right, Tupper. Any any other questions? Any, no, else? but it, yeah, I mean, it's important too. It <laughs> that the the source of all this information about where things have flown and specifically where things have uh, failed um, needs to come from the PIs back into the NASA system. Um, we 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 don't do a good job of sort of closing the engineering loop, right? We do all this analysis about how long something should last in space, under what radiation environment, uh, and then we launch it, and it you know it probably works, and but things do wear out and and fail, and we need to learn from those and close the loop back to the people who were doing designs and picking components. And without the knowledge of what's happening in the field, uh, you, you, you're you making decisions on on less than full data. So I, that, I do know that SpaceX maintains a database of their own experience with parts and actually consider that very proprietary and um, you know, it's very important information for them to know what commercial parts they can fly and cannot, you know, which ones failed, which ones did not fail. So it is very valuable information. Yeah, and then in the case of, uh, you know, PIs that are being funded by NASA, um, it, it's an expectation that, um, that that information come back to us to, to inform the future. Um, so. Thank you. All right, any other questions? Marks has a question. Oh, wait. All right, there he is. 
person. Yeah. So I, uh, the longer I do this, the more confused I am about the distinctions between the upper TRLs, but especially as it can, so. um, especially as it pertains to software though. And, and, and here I'm talking about non-flight software. Um, so think about a, a system that's designed to go into operations eventually um, on the ground uh, to do something for, let's say, space situational awareness. Um, any comments on how how we distinguish the relevant environment there, in the upper TRL levels, or, or do you have any experience that? Um, yeah, um, it's helpful. Uh, <laughs> the the yeah uh, in in those TRA guides, there's a whole section on software, um, which I've largely ignored. Um, it, where it gets a lot of attention is in like algorithms, especially if they're going to be on board. Um, and um, the reason for that is if if you don't know that your algorithm works um, to the to the precision and speed implemented in the silicon that you can fly, um, then there's still a risk, right? That's the whole point of TRL six. You put the scary stuff behind you before you spend big money. And if the scary stuff includes, you know, our algorithm uh, is not proven to work on the computers that we can fly, um, then then you're not at TRL six. Um, on the ground, it's it's different. Uh, I would say the same thing applies. Just put yourself in the mindset of the funder. We're we're about to give you the money to go build the real thing. Is there any risk that it's not going to work? And if your answer is, well, our algorithm works, but only on a supercomputer. Um, uh, but but we need it to work on something less than a supercomputer. Then you're not at TRL six. And the definition of seven, eight, and nine uh, in that case don't. <laughs> don't really matter. <laughs> the only the only thing is, are you above six or are you below six? Is there anything scary left to to prove? Right. Thank you. Great, thanks, Martin. Um, any other questions for Dr. Hyde before we move on to the other speakers? Thanks all. Thank you, Dr. Hyde.